25th hour radio show. We're ready to go. All right, poor guy. <laughs> How you doing today, by the way? I'm doing great. I have my cup of coffee. I got up late uh, after uh, after doing something yesterday and uh, feeling real good, taking it easy and getting ready to jump into my uh, electronic music stuff I'm doing. Your daily routine. Yeah, except much later. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed, you know, I got you on Facebook and and I noticed you're you're a night owl. No, not really. Not, not really. Since I got, no, not since I got, uh, I mean, I'll be up to 10, 11 on this Facebook, uh, I mean, Facebook. And, and I, uh, uh, my wife is a school teacher. She gets up at five. Okay. Gets, gets up at quarter after five. Well, I thought I, I was, do. I was up late last night and I think it was like one or two in the morning. And I thought I saw you had liked something or put something on Facebook. That's why I say that. Yeah, that's the first time I've been up since two. I had rehearsals and got home late, and uh, I was exhausted, and uh, but too tired to go to sleep. You ever do that? Oh, yeah, and, <laughs> every uh, night. So I just said the heck with it. I sat there and, and ate cheese and felt sorry for myself. It could be ice cream, but anyway, there you go. <laughs> so, so, Dwayne, you know, I've read you You grew up on a farm. Uh, how did you go from being a farm boy to being one of the best songwriters you know, of all time? How did you get your first break into the music scene? Well, I don't know about all time, but... Oh, uh, come on, don't be so humble. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I had a little trouble with David in the Old Testament, but other than that, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, the, rest were, the rest were knockovers. Uh, uh, I just, I don't know, it didn't come from anywhere in the... Um, anywhere from my family, uh, but uh, I do know that, uh, it's, uh, that uh, I saw my Uncle Elmer uh, play something called the Choo Choo Boogie when I was four years old on uh, this great big black box and it had white and black things that went up and down and he put his fingers on those things and he made the thing talk he played Choo Choo Boogie and of course you're talking about I, a piano right? Oh, an old Cable Nelson upright piano and my uh, my uh, <laughs> Grandpa and Grandma Hitchings uh, after church, uh, yeah, yeah, in their living room, and and I banged on the thing. I could not get that stinking thing to sound like Uncle Elmer, so I fell in love, and that was the beginning of the end for me. I could have had a decent life as a dentist, lawyer, anything, mm-hmm. but I just no, that did it. And at five, I started piano lessons. Now, now you're living in Nashville, right? Yes, I am. Now, you and, used to live in California. Am I, am I correct about that? Yes, I escaped there, too. I lived in about five different cities because um, uh, of my music. And uh left Syracuse uh, to go to music school, a uh, conservatory in San Francisco, conservatory in Philadelphia, a music conservatory. And uh, I spent a year at Syracuse University, uh, a year off. Uh, well, it was a year off. It was hard work. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, then went on to live in San Francisco, got in the business, moved down to Los Angeles, and uh, it's all a blur after that. I have <laughs> lived in Miami for quite a while, Coconut Grove, uh, the Groovy Grove in the beginning of the seventies. You can only guess what's going on, what's going on there. Escape of my life. So you're you're back to LA. when when you say you're uh, someone is an American, you really are an American. You've been all around the world. Yeah, I have. Uh, I, I was blessed to go on a. Uh, and I mean blessed uh, to go on a cruise four and a half years ago, and somebody wanted to have a a girl singer. She's on my website. Her name is uh, Valerie Borman. She's outrageous, three and a half, four octave range. Had her own, had her own band up in Pennsylvania. And I found her through uh, somewhere because I wanted to put a duo together beside my writing. I wanted to play. I'm a player, mm-hmm. uh, classical pianist. Jazz, you know, at B3 Oregon. But uh, writing has seemed to be the thing that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, I seem to do uh, better at anything else as far as success, whatever that is. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, so I went on this cru- We got together, and we had an offer to go on a cruise around the world for four months. And it was a gift from... Uh, the 
the way I believe from uh, from God. I, I mean, we you don't make a lot of money, but I mean, you haven't lived until you try to get off a camel. We're in Egypt, <laughs> and, and getting on a camel. No, that's the easy part. Getting off the camel. Anybody who wants to get on a camel, remember the off part. And the person who is handling the camel for you is in front of you, and he's huge to catch you. <laughs> and it's on the pyramids, went to the Suez Canal, went to France, uh, got chased. We were the first cruise boat to ever get chased by pirates off into the uh, Suez Canal. It happened like 3 in the morning. Wow. Uh, 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 went to Vietnam, uh, Thailand, uh uh, uh, let me. Oh, we went to. Uh, oh, where did they hold the flag up? World War Two. Oh, jeez. Oh, the island. You, you caught me. Oh, <laughs> uh, Iwo Jima. Uh, Iwo Jima. That's it. And every person we were on a seven hundred person boat, and it's called a, a Golden Circle Cruise. Uh, uh, Pacific Princess has them. Wonderful people, but these people were extremely, extremely wealthy. And it was only 700 foot long, not the thousand big barges they have that just got pulled in here that caught on fire or something happened. Uh, these ships were meant to go across the ocean, and smaller, and uh, very wealthy, but very, very, very sweet people. Uh, and uh, we, uh, yeah, we got chased. We wow. got chased up, into the, and uh, there was an Italian captain aboard. We didn't know it, but it was an fe- uh, Italian special ops team. I saw them at 3 in the morning run down the dock with various things that went boom. Yeah, that had to be uh, kind of uh, scary. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I was, I've, been, I've, I've retired, though, but I was in the Tennessee State Guard. Not the National Guard, the mm-hmm. Tennessee State Guard, which is the official auxiliary. We're on the same site. And I know exactly what they had in their hands. And I'm going, oh, right, we're talking about it. We're talking about some excitement on the road here. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of <laughs> out of the norm. Like the Al- I don't like the Alice Cooper band. I thought that was dangerous. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, uh, it, it's, uh, but I lived in L.A. to write songs. And during the, uh, the, seven, uh, the end of the 70s, all the 80s, right up to the beginning of the 90s, uh, that's when music was really being made. A lot of rock and roll is yeah. dead now. Yeah. A couple bands have been playing. And, 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 yeah, music right, has changed. You know, right, please, no, it's next. You know, <laughs> what's next? Yeah, I mean, songs these days, you know, they're burnt out after, uh, you know, two or three months. You, don't, yeah, you won't hear them again uh, a year from now. You won't hear them ever. Yeah, I, uh, no, no, it's the same old cookie cutter junk. Uh, the things that are coming out that people don't even know this—it's a tsunami, and people don't know it—is uh, electric dance music, which is not really DJs. It started there. Uh, they're composers who write, uh, do their basic tracks of electronic music with bands sometimes, or a vocalist or whatever. And then they'll come out, and then they will jam to it. Average audience for two top DJs is a hundred thousand a night. Wow! The Stones can't do that. No, that's big. That's huge. Uh, this goes on every weekend in the world. Wow! Uh, uh, go to something called uh, DJ Magazine, mm-hmm. and they'll list the, the top ten DJs. They're called DJs. It's called EDM now, like dance music. It's called everything. Uh, they, they have different styles. I was in Woodstock, standing in the field of Woodstock two days uh, two days before Woodstock uh, with Michael Lang, was a promoter, and Jimmy McCarty, who played with the, the Detroit Wheels. We were in the Buddy Miles Express, mm-hmm. 1968. And uh, he was worrying if he'd have enough food for ten or 15,000 people. That's what Michael was worrying about <laughs> before it hit. Yeah, before. And this, this EDM, and for a lot of the college kids and stuff, uh, Mumford and the Sons, right? Yeah. Who won uh, Grammy for the album of the year? Mm-hmm. That's uh, that. That's a new type of Americana, but it's not just Americana. Country music came from Ireland, but it's, it's folk music. That's number two, and number three. For some reason, tribute bands are taking over, where the big bands, uh, you know, like Bad Company and. And these uh, different bands used to uh, play, and they play in casinos. People don't care, you know. Mm-hmm. Hey, yeah, he looks like uh, yeah, he looks like Elvis good. Hey, good enough. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, 
come on, honey, let's lose some more money. <laughs> but uh, EDM is enormous. Uh, uh, and people are going, huh? And people I know, in the business real well, not uh, uh, getting hip to it. And I started electronic music in 1960, uh, 1966 at Fall Over Conservatory with a great big old MOOC size of a refrigerator. I'll stop talking here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. Bob, met a guy named Bob Mook, and uh, he couldn't afford his own serviceman. And a wonderful gentleman. He's from Binghamton. I'm from Syracuse. And then in 1996, after writing a song called Do You Think I'm Sexy, which I still don't like that well, neither does Rod. But <laughs> you don't we, like the song? Not especially. <laughs> I like uh, it. I like. I love that song. Everybody, everybody, yeah, everybody hey, I, loves it. I am not arguing, brother. I do cash those checks. <laughs> and if you knew Mr. Stewart, he'd cash them, too. Oh, absolutely. But, but it was a put down of disco. And the thing he didn't like about it, I, I think, I'm not going to speak for him, but I think it, it didn't go far enough as far as being sarcastic. Uh, and especially the video where he's waddling around in those, those, uh, those, those tiny pants and stuff. <laughs> it was... It was it, it was a put down a disco, and in some interviews he said he was getting sick of the disco and all this other stuff. Now I gotta ask you: Did you ever wear stuff like that? Did I wear who? Did you ever wear clothes like that when you played with Rod? I never. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first. I said, did you did you ever wear uh, clothing like that when you played with Rod? Not if I could help it. <laughs> I wouldn't wear that in my bedroom. <laughs> no, I, um, uh, neither would he. he just, and he got put down for it. <laughs> One guy at a record company, I was working with a band, uh, I, I discovered a band, and the manager, manager helped me discover them, over the valley uh, called City Kid. Oh, yeah. They became Tesla. They became Tesla. And the guy who got them signed, uh, claimed he got them signed, found them. It was, no, it was a girl that found them. It worked at Geffen. He actually blamed me, the A and R guy at Geffen, for influencing Rod Stewart to do you think I do? Do you think I'm sexy and spoil his career? Now, imagine trying to go up to Donald Trump or General Patton, okay, mm -hmm. and talking to those people and telling them what to do. That's about me, like telling Rod what to do. Uh, Roger M1 Tank, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's one of the most brilliant businessmen and people I've ever met. Alice Cooper's another one. And, and uh, it's just silly. However, it did, it did put disco away, and Rod stopped playing it. And it was like, it was like almost, stop playing Maggie May or Hot Legs. You don't do that in a Rod Stewart show. Oh no! People are waiting knows, for that song. Yeah, he, you are right there. And and uh, you know, Maggie Mayer, you he just blazed out any part of any of his shows, and the audience will sing. Uh, like Art Brooks, you know, it just stop. It just keeps singing. But uh, that that's that's what that whole yeah. It, it would be almost like Garth Brooks stopped playing "Friends in Low Places." Exactly. You would expect that song, you know, to be played oh, at every concert. Yes. Yep. The dance. I mean, yeah. uh, if you get the video of him in Ireland, it's, it's just, uh, it's just a uh, British right? 750,000 people at that concert. But uh, anyway, they, you know, uh, uh, I, I was happy I wrote it. Uh, I, I, Ten seconds, I left my uh, grocery list uh, in my house in Hollywood, starving to death, three months late in my rent. And uh forgot my grocery list, went back in, Carmen a piece, we've known forever, uh we're cactus together and stuff. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for those ten seconds, there'd be no do you think I'm sexy. I walked in, he called. I started to walk out the door, he called to pick up the phone, almost didn't. And he says, Let get an English guy. They don't know what you know, he's from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to write this. They, you know, we gotta do this the way we gotta write a disco song. I go, what? <laughs> Rod. I go, okay, fine. Hey, I'll take anything. And uh, I said, when do you want to get together? He says, well, uh, I'll be over in about five minutes. I said, Tom, are you crazy? I said, you know, I was gonna say, you know, like next Tuesday or something like this. And we came over. 
we wrote it in 20 minutes. He had a couple court changes. I had a couple lines in my right hand. And uh, Rod heard it and said, that's it. Within two hours. Yeah, you know. Uh, and he had the song in his head. And, uh, you know, and that's, uh, that 10 seconds was the beginning of my career. Writing career. Yeah, have most of your hit songs been written fairly quickly? I mean, it seems that most musicians that I talk to, they all say the same thing, that most of their hits are written within an hour or, or less, sometimes yeah. just a few minutes. Exactly. You get, you know, I like to think it comes from somewhere else, uh, through the top of your head and not your heart. You know, and like a, like a, like a bend in a water pipe. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, 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 uh, uh, they call it a kneel. A knee. There we go. <laughs> Gotta be technical. But, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it, and I've never had something as big yet. I've had a couple that are close. Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, I like infatuation. Uh, Sounds like you that. You turn that in or you're crazy. I said, it's just a jam. That's the point. And I sent it in, and he turned some things around. Kevin Savagar put on a really cool line. Um, uh, uh, I didn't play keyboards on it. And uh, and darn if it didn't turn, really turn into something. And I just, uh, uh, I was really happy about that. And so... Uh, can I, can I ask you about one more song that you wrote uh, for Rod, uh, Young Turks? Because I really do. I love this song. How did that Young song Turks? come about? Yeah. See, I know Weird Al Yanovich. I know his manager very well. He's a dear friend of mine. We're going to come out uh, with, uh, we're trying to talk Weird Al into doing, instead of Young Turks, Young Jerks. <laughs> and then Infatuation, a flagellation. I thought it would be hit. Then what? I mean, wouldn't you think so? Oh, yeah, I love Weird Al's music. I love it. I love it. Oh, he's a, he's a mess. Platinum album. Every album for five or six albums in a row, I think, every year. Well, he, he deserves it. But of course he does. And he's a, the sweetest cat in the world. He's a real good guy. You can tell him older. Cat, she's <laughs> Um uh, But that um, uh, Young Turks, something happened. 1983, everything went dead. It's stuck. Pretty much like country right now. All cookie cutter. Um, uh, except a few artists. I, I'm one of the few artists, I think, that understands Taylor Swift. She's a brilliant <laughs> woman. She's, she's written a 1,100-page novel. She's written song after song. My godson, family, is friends of her family. I believe that's the connection. Now, okay. Taylor, Taylor writes all of her music, does she not? She co she's co-written it, as I understand. But she has, she is the singer, the blues singer for white teenagers. Okay. And they're blues. And, 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 and sisters, too. I don't like the words black and white. Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't know about you, but I'm just I'm a bit of a tan. And all my <laughs> brothers, they're dark brown. You know, that's pretty much it. That's a, great, that's a great way to look at it. She has written, and our blood's red, right? right. And and uh, Taylor has written songs for what a thirty-year-old woman's life would be like, what a forty-year-old woman's would be like, or men, or situation, divorce, alcoholism, drug addiction, all this other stuff that people go through. Now she's twenty-three years old. How does she know that stuff? And the songs are awesome, but she cannot release them yet not as a 23 year old mm -hmm. she's smart enough to know that so you're saying she's got all these songs that's just hidden 
She's about as dumb as Oprah, okay? <laughs> That's Belly not very dumb. These women are not dumb. Mm-hmm. So, uh, 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 I, 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 I sent a couple of letters to Bob Levitz, got him all screwed, you know. But I guess it might have been return anything, probably could care less. I don't know if you know about Bob Levitz. Uh, he's got an incredible site that everyone should read if they're a musician. B-O-B, Levitz, like L E F. At s t e z dot com, it's free, mm-hmm. and he talks about music every day and being yourself, and uh, uh, he's really the Pied Piper of uh, new music. I'm watching Woodstock all over again. That's what I was so you start think- here on doing what I was talking about Woodstock. Uh, everything is is, is it, the old is getting thrown out, the new is coming in. And uh, it, it's delightful to see it. So you and, suggest this site that you just spoke of to uh, new songwriters, struggling songwriters, uh, musicians? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry? I said, do you, do you, I guess you suggest this site that you just spoke of, the Bob Levin site, to uh, probably uh, new uh, musicians, young, struggling songwriters? Heck yes. Oh, my heavens, they need to hear it. They need to hear it more than anybody else. You are not a star. You are happy. <laughs> you are happy with what you do. Do you think it's hard? I, to... I, I, can, I can tell by your voice. You are happy with what you do. Oh, I love what I do. I get to talk to oh. people like you every day. <laughs> it's great. Oh, dear. I don't know about that part. But anyway. <laughs> I'm having a pretty good time. <laughs> Symbol. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it just, it just, and he's got such good wisdom. He said something great today uh, about getting old. And, uh, yeah, I'm in my 60s, too. And, uh, but, um, anyway, uh, oh, oh, I get, I love Buddy Trails, as I'm sure you've picked up by now. That, that there was a band that broke out, like things are breaking out now to change things. Hopefully country music's going to wake up, and I know of a couple new artists right now that's going to wake it up big time. Uh, remember when the Mandrell sisters were out, and it was all... Cushy and all this other stuff, and then a guy came out named Ricky Skaggs, mm-hmm. and he broke it wide open. He took it back home. Music has to, it gets all mushy and cushy, and everybody gets comfortable, and they're afraid to take any chances, and they don't want to lose their jobs, and they just bought that million dollar half, half, million and a half dollar home, and they don't know if the next record's going to sell or not. Yeah. And that includes the producers and record companies. So, uh, a band called out came out called Devo. Oh yeah, whip it! <laughs> this was new wave, man. The Cars, Devo, Pat Benatar, uh, uh, Chrissy Hine, the Pretenders. <clears throat> this was new wave. Well, I love Devo because I'm a sequencer guy. I mean, a synthesizer guy. Mm-hmm. And that went ding 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 that's what I'm going to do. So that's how Young Turks came around. Uh, it was I was sponsored by Oberheim at the time, and we had an OBXA classic synthesizer, the synthesizer on. Uh, oh, dum, 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 uh, oh, what that Van Halen song with a big synthesizer sound? Oh, you put me on the spot again. I got the last one. Dum, 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 dum. Oh, for heaven's sake. Eddie and I bought the synthesizer the same day, at the same place, same time, uh, in L.A. Except he, he wrote uh, that song. And, and uh, I wrote Young Turk, so I guess we turned out pretty good. But he, it, it was the old BXA I bought, and then something called a DMX drum box, and then a DMA sequencer. It was the first one-man band. Okay, you could do drums and bass and synthesizer and edit to your eight track key act, right? Mm-hmm. And you wasn't uh, thinking so of I, jump, was you? Yes, jump. That's good it. Lord. <laughs> yeah, the key did pretty good with that synthesizer. Uh, not many people know it, but Eddie and his brother Alex are uh, were training to be concert pianists. Both of them, the drummer, mm-hmm. and and. Uh, Extremely talented, but uh, but anyway, that's what I gave to Rod. I said well, he wanted something new and fresh, and uh, 
same thing while I was working with Kevin Carnes and Rod. They both asked me two different times. Uh, I mean, each each one one time. They said, "Give me something that you wouldn't think in a million years I'd like, but you've got to love it. Do you really think it's good? And you think it's worth giving to me, but you wouldn't think that I'd like it, but you got to like it." Well, that's what I did with Rod. It worked. And and because uh, they get the same stuff, you know. I, I mean, can you imagine how many Maggie Mays Rod Stewart has gotten? <laughs> Millions, you know. I mean, isn't that right? I mean, yeah. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of of uh, hit songs just laying around that no one's been able to to put out yet. Yeah. Or no, or know yeah. how to put it out. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and it's because oh well, nobody would do this. Well, yeah, they would. Uh, I have a my godson, Lat Smith. He's gonna be huge. He's gonna be enormous. He's just he's, he's just a, he's a genius. He run. A, a, he's from uh, Hendersonville here. Now, His now, family on. Now, who who hmm? did you say again? Who did you say? Who are we talking about? Lat Smith. Okay. Uh, his family owns the Archival Music Store in Hendersonville, and. Uh, 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 he won the guitar player of the world contest at Guitar Player Magazine three years ago. And his guitar player was really like rusty and everything else. He grew up sitting on Johnny Cash's lap. And uh, uh, Conway Twitty and uh, Willie Nelson would be all down to Argyle's music, uh, quite possibly with jars of clear liquid. <laughs> <laughs> and some old Jack Daniels, who knows? There used to be jam sessions and stuff. And that's how Lat grew up when he was five years old. And he, he grew up around all these wonderful people uh, uh, and talented people, but he had the talent, of course. Yeah, he, he, he knows the, nothing but how to make good music. <laughs> uh, yeah, Lad is in LA right now, and I uh, hopefully he'll he'll be back. But he's already written three hit records. Three hit, I mean, uh, poetry is so good. Go to his site, you, I'm not advertising for anybody else, but go to his site on uh, uh, latsmith.com, but but on uh, Reverb Nation, okay, okay, or MySpace or something there. MySpace is pretty much dead, but uh, Reverb Nation. And there's a song called Treehouse. All right. And he wrote a song and played it for my my. Uh, I got married four months ago to it, the one I've been looking for all this time. Oh, congratulations! Yeah, a lot of, well, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, she's a, 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 a she's a assistant principal of a Montessori school. Uh, I guess assistant assistant teach something like that, and a Montessori school for elementary children. Now, what better man could she marry? <laughs> Stop think about that for a minute. <laughs> A total child. <laughs> so anyway, what in the hell are we talking? What are we talking about? I, I don't know. What were you trying to get me? To- <laughs> <laughs> we, we're, we're, we're I both. I got you confused. Look, I'm going to interview you for a while. You can go on bunny trails. Oh and, uh, man! Yeah. Oh, oh man! You've already interviewed me. Uh, interviewed me a couple times. I come up with Iwo, Iwo Jima and jump. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Do you think it's harder these days to make it in the music business and actually make a career from it than, you know, before the Internet came about? You know, you, oh, yes. More so. Do you think people have to work I, that much I, harder? You know? I, it, it, it's, it's always 5%. I don't care what you do. It's always 5%. Baseball. Only the top 5% get to play and get paid. For the little, you know, the the the, the, uh, the the little baseball teams, you know, in little small towns, they still get paid. You know, the local Cleveland baseball team, and then there's a the big one, right? Mm-hmm. Here in Nashville, we have a small baseball team, and some of these guys get lucky and go up in the big leagues. Music, the top five percent, make it one way or another. There's only twenty five thousand people in the United States, maybe in the here in Europe. To make a living at music. I'm talking, we start right at the Holiday Inn in the local bars with the screens where they throw beer bottles at you. I've been there all the way to being Garth Brooks and Rod Stewart and uh, Taylor Swift. That's it. Mm-hmm. We're small, so you don't want to do too many bad things in this business. We find out real quick. 
And 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 but I applaud, and this has something to do with your question. Uh, for once, I applaud the people who stole all the records. They put all these guys, crooks, out of business. And most of the record companies, most of these people, most, it's a big word, M-O-S-T. Not everybody's crooked. And other people, the, the good ones, have stayed. I can't tell you how much I've been ripped. I don't even think about how much I've been ripped off. My attorney, <laughs> and now my publisher, has told me what my guessing was. And I'm just small potatoes. I'm certainly no, uh, 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 oh, what's her name, uh, Diane Warren. There's a publishing business, and then there's Diane Warren. <laughs> what, 110 number ones? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Wow. She's been ripped. We've all been ripped off. And the radio station, she heard the same 20 songs. Did your song have a chance? Is it, a, is it an artist that might be making, uh, pull, uh, pulling in 10,000 uh, people a night, not doing bad on the B list, but still doing good? Mm -hmm. Do they get a chance to be on the ra radio? Oh, no. Hell no. No way. So guess what? Radio is dying. What about the, the and, what about satellite radio? Cool. That is cool. I, I like you know, I like XM. I like XM a lot. Oh yeah, it's serious. I mean, that's it's wonderful stuff. But you can get to the, you get up there and you can just push your push the station have what you want. But you know the biggest the best radio station in the world is is the iPod. Oh yeah, listen to what you want to. Yeah. Why not? Sound sucks. People are going to start catching on that those earbuds really suck. <laughs> but they haven't got it through. And it's just as well because if they turn it up, they can ruin your hearing. Well, I know, I know that, uh, you know, like we were talking about earlier, we're talking about, you know, XM radio and stuff like that. You know, you get to choose your music. You know, I'm not choosing today's music. I'm al I've always got it on the 70s or 80s. Good for you. <laughs> that's what you want. That's the and good that's music. What, you know, that's that's, that's the music. That's the mainstay. That's where you go to when you really want to hear good music. That's exactly right. And it'll start happening again. It's just in a different form. Right now, we're going through Woodstock. We're going through the 60s again. It's tribal. At the uh, uh, EDM concerts, uh, uh, Chiesto. 45 million net, got his own jet and stuff. A freaking DJ? But he also, uh, 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 oh, for heaven's sake. You got that uh, one Joel DJ Denver. out, the, the DJ that dress, dresses up like the mouse, the DJ Dead Mouse. I was just going to say, uh, 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 oh, for heaven. Joel, Joel Zimmer, brilliant. I think he's got his master's in electronics or something. He's brilliant. And he is our Bob Dylan. He don't give a rat's ass what he says. And people will say, well, you don't spin your turntable and go... <laughs> and there, if that is an art. It's called turn turntablism. It's really an art. you got to be good at it. No, you can't just... In, not not anybody can do that. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? You gotta, you got to... Uh, lots of times, you got to do two or three songs in a row the same tempo in the same key, if you reach your audience, just like a good entertainer does. One of the greatest audience uh, readers I've ever seen is Rod Stewart. Is, because they can change songs. They'll turn around and go, boom, 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 boom. Uh, Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra uh, was Rod's, one of his great teachers. Rod and Nancy Sinatra were very good friends. Yeah. And, and Frank would sit there and tell him, I'm going to stay around, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, during that time, period you're talking about was the highlight of rock pop music it started with the beatles right before mm -hmm. that it was classic rock and roll the beatles and the last grammys the grammys for the last did you see what happened paul mccartney was part of it he was kind of like a master of ceremonies was he grammy before last okay. and it stopped and then it comes on dead mouse and paul galata electronic edms and then Foo Fighters. And that was the new, that was the kind of last, they're one of the few rock and roll bands on how to play rock and roll and kick ass. Yeah, Foo and, Fighters, are a lot of a lot of older acts, you know, like the Stones and stuff like that, they, they say that the Foo Fighters are probably, you know, like the greatest, you know, the band that they like the most 
out of all the bands, you know, of this. Well, you know, there's only about three or four of them that happen to be one of them. Yeah. Well, there you go. Because <laughs> boy, those boys kick ass. They kick ass as hard as anything in the eighties and nineties. They, they're good. They're great. Thank heavens, there's something left. Uh, but again, again, what has happened is all the people who stole music, but cleaned it out, cleaned it out, and, and the the artists who are now appearing that are called DJs. They really are. It's composers, producers. Now. You will find David Goetta, uh, Paul Van Dyke, for instance, showing up with a drummer, two guitar players, a keyboard player. Or there might be a horn section. Mm-hmm. And they may come out and just play two songs. And by the way, the songs are 20 minutes long. And in 1996, I did a uh, rave version of Do You Think I'm Sexy? That's what they called rave back then. Yeah. And there's not concerts anymore. They're called events. It's tribal. It's 100,000 people getting together. It's all forty dollars a ticket. There ain't no seats, and they dress up. And uh, when you go to the big concerts, uh, Tiesto, Dead Mouse, uh, uh, Skrillex, nineteen years old, brilliant. He, he really put the nail on dubstep. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, and 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 Armin Van Buren. I love trance. I love trance especially. Uh, th- these guys hire. They'll spend a hundred thousand dollars on a circus coming in. For a two day concert or one day. We had one here in Nashville. Scrolls came in. Only sixty six hundred people showed up, but let me tell you something about people down south. I'm I come off a dairy farm, but I live in a city. So I'm a mutt. I'm both. I understand both <laughs> things. People in Tennessee don't like it when it gets down to thirty four degrees. You understand? <laughs> <laughs> so there have been sixty thousand people here. They're gonna come back. Dead Mouse and Skrillex are going to come back here uh, this spring. And you're going to be reading about it in the newspaper. It's going to be about, about 100,000 people. Atlanta, June 6th, they're having a three-day thing. I just got on my email uh, that will be for three days. The last time they had a three-day event, it was 350,000 people five months ago in Vegas. 350,000. $75 for all three days. You do the math. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good chunk of change there. But 26, 27, maybe 30. Uh, uh, 30 uh, DJs slash composers slash producers. Okay. Also, some. Uh, 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 there will also be some uh, uh, Americana. Okay. I've seen guys get up with synthesizers before, and a guy sitting there with a, with uh, uh, playing some ancient Indian string lute instrument, and it mixes, it works. Again, it's Woodstock. It's being an incentive. New, fresh, anything. Uh, the, the rap artists, man, are, are, are getting the smoke, man. They're starting to use synthesizers, using melody half the time. They're using rap half the time. It, it's just a wonderful creative period. And uh, it'll last about 10 years, and the business will get in the middle of it, screw it up, and we're off again. <laughs> <laughs> now, hey. By that time, I'm going to be so old, I don't give a crap. <laughs> hey, I know you like working with new talent. Uh, who are you working with now, and what can we expect in the future from them? Uh, 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 me. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I kind of thought I you were... Know. I don't know whether to call myself Digital Hitch or Grandpa Trance. Uh, <laughs> somebody said that Grandpa Trance would be good. I kind of like uh, that. Yeah, I kind of like yeah, Grandpa uh, Trance. What the hell? I'm at least 70 in April. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, got a, it's got a nice little ring to it. Yeah, it's got a ring. Yeah, like, go home, Dwayne. Shut up. <laughs> I think that's the ring. No, I think that but, would, bring, uh, I think that would bring, bring in the crowd. I really like that, Grandpa Well, Trance. it explains that I'm a 70-year-old man, will be. Uh, I have a receding hairline. Uh, I'm old, I'm happy, and and I got a wife as an elementary school teacher. Hey, get a couple, yeah. hey, get a couple uh, glow sticks, and you'll be set. She understands me. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and and um, but but uh, yes, yes, there is a young man. One is Rod Smith. Rod definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a, uh, a young man that I've. I've uh, been playing with. Uh, uh, he is like, I hate to say this, but he's a new Garth Brooks. He really is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you don't listen to country music, if anybody reads this or record, I don't know what I'm doing here. I really don't. <laughs> um, uh, talking a lot. Um, 
they're watch country artists lately. They stand there. They don't know what the word entertainment means. You just don't stand there with your hat. Yeah, there's only a few country artists who can stand there and get away with it. Alan Jackson, George Strait. There's two that come to mind. They can get away with it, but most country artists, like you said, cannot. And, and possum. But then again, possum oh, like yeah. was. Yeah, I mean he, he he was one of the greats that created it all. But yeah, Alan Jackson. Yeah, George Strait. The women. As long as they're as long as their dungarees are tight in the back, you know what I mean. <laughs> and he's got them pants See, pulled up a little box. bit, and the big buckle, he's he's set. Yep, and the big buckle and the shirt has got a perfect crease. <laughs> exactly. And they're real handsome, which they are. Uh, George Strait's like Dick Clark for God's sakes. When when is he gonna get old? <laughs> uh, they're happy. And by the way, the women in country music buy CDs. They buy an EDM. Like, oh, that's another thing. They give their music away. You know why? Every every day they do the, this, the song different. It's 20 minutes long. Why, why do it? And if you were making $4 million a night, would you really give a rat's butt if you sold some records? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It just, and so uh, it's it's put away with the... It's it's put in a lot of, a lot of corruptions and the forced listening, waiting for your hit to come up. You know, it's over with, it's done, finished. So a young artist, be good. Back to your question, just have a good time, and 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 and, and be honest with yourself. Two ways. I suck, but I'm having a good time anyway. Or, I know I'm good, and I'm starving right now, but I can't do anything else. I have no choice. Those are the ones that make it, without a doubt. So, so would you say that was your advice to be to, to yeah. young songwriters out there? If you love it and want to do it, you got to be, hey, you may have a family, but, and by, oh, I'm going to quote another songwriter. His name is Don Goodman, who I've had the honor to work with. He wrote... Uh, Angels Among Us, uh, that, uh, now this country, Angels Among Us, uh, done by Alabama, which is a gorgeous mm -hmm. song. Mm -hmm. And another song called uh, a Ring of My Finger, Tan on My Hands, Reva McIntyre, and maybe a hundred other hits. And then he wrote a thing that got to make a movie out called Old Red. It's about an old red chick hound dog, and this guy killed a guy who was uh, making love to his wife or something. Go make a movie out of it. But is that kind of from the Blake Shelton song, Old Red? Exactly. Okay. That's I think that's the third number one he's had on that song, or second one. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, he always said, he says, Hitch, just remember, it's always 100. I said, wonder what? He says, the 100th, the first 99 takes it to make 100. 100 goes in your top 10 list. Then you do it all over again. And you put those five together and pray that one will make it. That'll make it 500. I just don't that's very discouraging. But you know something? I'm such an idiot, I've done that. <laughs> so that's what you do. And you always keep a little tape recorder around. Always. He's a little Olympus. You know these guys. You're a writer. Mm hmm and, 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 you, and you keep that sucker around. And um, uh, I used to drive. Uh, I had a girlfriend. I had a Volkswagen. And for some reason, when I drove for a Volkswagen, it was that high, you know, on the bug. <laughs> I, the engine makes some sort of noise. It's a high frequency. I could sit there and write melody after melody after melody. So I, I would sit there and I'd carry the sick and, hey, whatever works, you know? Yeah. But I never thought I, of doing that when it was doing that in my vehicles when I was younger. <laughs> I had no choice. I, I, my car broke down. I didn't have any money. And uh, uh, my poor girlfriend, she had to... But every time I, I lived in Miami for a while, uh, at the wrong time, at the beginning of the 70s, I don't think I have to fill that in. Um, and then when they started shooting up shopping centers, the Coke dealers with uh, uh, 50 calibers, it was time to leave. Yeah. And I went to L.A., but... But uh, it was a groovy grove. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, just, 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 you're in love if you're a songwriter. If 
a good guitar player. You're in love. You got to do it. And for God's sakes, explain it to your partner, your family, or whatever. I can't help it. I've got to do this. Mm-hmm. When you got it, you you know what I'm talking about. You're doing what you want to do right now. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I know exactly what you mean too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're happy about talking to me. Uh, you haven't had much time to talk, but, but you know. <laughs> hey, that's hey, that's the beauty of my job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor <laughs> thing. Any, anyway, uh, 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 you know, you know, you know exactly what I do. And if you and I can instill in these other people, writers, look at Bob Luffett. Look at look at all the great writers in the history. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do, brother. And and uh, hey, you and I, we might have to go out and pick some hamburgers, right? Oh yeah. Especially if you're younger, and maybe if you're older. Well, no, they see me they'll send me over to be a, a greeter at uh, Walmart. The problem is, <laughs> the line's too long, and, and I look too old. So, <laughs> but but you got to love what you do. Got to love what you do. And 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 uh, and and if you got to work at a place you don't like, especially or something to do, there's, there's there's people there that love what they do. So don't bitch about it, and and then come home and do what you love to do. You know? Would you say that? Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, I one hundred percent agree with you there. Yeah, I mean because just... if you if you don't, you know it's it's a life. Uh, it's a tragedy, basically. Your own life has yeah. become a tragedy. Yes, it is. Well, uh, there's an expression, uh, and it can be used in two ways. I think you just brought this to my mind. Uh, uh, is uh, living a life in quiet desperation. Uh, you're a writer, so you might know where that came from. Or two people that are, not, that are unhappy with their marriage but still live together after 40 years, uh, living a life of quiet desperation. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, whoa. Uh, you just reminded me of that saying, what you just said. I just, uh, I can't do that, bro. Oh, I bring I on inspiration. <laughs> huh? I, br- I brought on inspiration to you. Maybe you'll go uh, after this interview, you'll write a hit song. And you can, can and you can say I, I was the one who helped you with it. Well, if you're smart at all, you'd say I want twenty percent. <laughs> hey, I want twenty percent. <laughs> and get off the phone and call your lawyer immediately. <laughs> you got hey, a record. handshake. Hey, a handshake is, is, is you know, or or just your word is bond. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, in L A. Uh, L A. I have. Yeah, you love this expression. Yeah, a lot of my friends are. A lot of my friends are black, and a lot of my friends are Jewish. Um, this is not meant to sound this way at all. The music industry came out of New York, and ninety uh, percent of it was the Jewish tribe. I have a lot of friends that have Jewish backgrounds. That's it. We're all human beings. However. My attorney was Bill Colvin. He was, and why a lot of country people used him, like Mel Tillis and, and Pam and the Oak Ridge Boys and, and I did, on and on and on. Roy Clark, and he wore a, and I'll get to the point here, he wore a plaid shirt, dungarees, and he wore uh, uh, sneakers. And he hated attorneys. And he was one of the best attorneys in the music business. And and he he uh, he, he taught, I watched him do this when they talked to each other because the majority were of the tribe they knew each other okay mm-hmm. and if you weren't of the Jewish tribe and you were Anglo, uh, you know Christian Buddhist I don't care what you were your word was your bond and every contract he would sign for me once a year is something called meet him. He'd do by word. He'd do by word. The contracts would be like tw- 20 pages thick, but your word was your bond. Wouldn't it that be nice to still be able often. to do that? Yeah. Wouldn't huh? it be nice if the world just, just uh, was able to work in that way? No. Oh. It'd be boring. What are they going to put on the news? <laughs> I mean, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, you know, good news? Oh, the news people. Right. Edward R. Murrow is rolling in his grave right now. And Walter Cronkite, can you imagine? The news, the news people, the news system is pitiful. It's just, it's, it's a mess. Yeah, that's but, a whole nother story right there. <laughs> yeah, oh, 
good heavens. Uh, it's, and, and, but uh, I have a particular belief that things are, uh, the party's coming to a climax, and it's not going to be especially uh, attractive. <laughs> no, no. It, it, <laughs> it's going to make a Bruce Willis or Arnold Schwarzenegger film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a love story. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in full HD, for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Hey, Dwayne. High demolition. <laughs> anyway. Dwayne, i got to ask you before we get off here, is there any social media or websites that people can go and check out you know, what's going on with you? Yes, and don't let their children hear this because it's, it, it could be harmful to their... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's Reverb Nation. Reverb Nation. It is literally my record company, production company, promotion, everything. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful for a guy like me. By the way, I do not write lyrics. I, I will work with a lyricist, you say, as a writer. Mm-hmm. I write music. I write the music part. Okay. Um, uh, it's Reverb Nation. Uh, a little, and then Dwayne Hitchings, D U A N E H I T C H I N G S, backslash, and don't ask me why I put this down, <laughs> Digital Hitch, D I G I T A L, Hitch, and it's all one word. It's going to be Grandpa Trance. Mm-hmm. Any- There's an 84 year old woman in Europe who is a DJ. You ever heard of, of Mama Rock? I haven't heard of her, no. Oh, she's dripping with diamonds. She claims she's 69. She's full of it. But she draws 20, 30,000 people. And how old is she? 84? She's in her 80s. She's got to be in her 80s. There's no way she's late 70s. And you say she's a DJ. Darn right. What she's is- up there just uh, slapping the records down. And, and her, her, her young nephew, she went to pick him up or something. I don't know what the story was. Went to pick him up. And, uh, so I love it. She the kids are having a ball. Now, I believe Mama Rock was party party girl when she was younger. <laughs> but evidently comes from a very wealthy English family, you know, blue blood. Mm-hmm. And she got a couple turntables. Her nephew taught her how to do it. And she's known as Mama Rock. And go on, go on uh, Google and bring up uh, Mama Rock, uh, uh, older lady, England's DJ. I'll do it. And it shows you. <laughs> you will see her smoke. So <laughs> me, being, me being 70 in April, I'm a teenager. So if she can do it, so can I. Wow, you're never too old to start something new. No. Heck no. I mean, there's Einstein sticking his tongue out. I mean, you know, hey, I like the guy. Anyway, well, Dwayne, thank I- you so much for your ear. You probably got a headache, so. Oh, no, I love the conversation I had with you. I uh, hope you come back on again someday. And I, and I know uh, I know you know Ben. You know, I wanted to ask you one more one more question before we get off. Yeah, Ben, right. He, we, we, <laughs> I got to ask you we, about Ben. We had a funnel. We put a lot of medicine into it and put it in his mouth and didn't do a bit of good. <laughs> no, he's a dear. I knew Ben when he couldn't play Sutbury chords, but, and he's turned into a phenomenal musician, and he's extremely bright. And I found out he's one of the best sound engineers I've ever heard. He came over to my place here last week, and I just I was amazed at what he did. Uh, I like Benny a lot. He's yeah, I, I've gotten to know Ben online through uh, many numerous emails and texts over the past year, and, and I can't wait to someday meet him. And hopefully one oh, day I can yeah. meet you too. Oh, well, yeah, me too, man. We'll go out and see if we can get arrested. <laughs> hey, man, it won't be too hard. We're from I the 80s. I'm from the 80s. <laughs> I, hey, I'd say five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to break that record. <laughs> All right, you got it. Hey, uh, Dwayne, thank you very much for show, uh, joining us today. Thank you, sir. And you have a blessed day. You too. Radio Show.